Okay, in this video, I'm just going to give you an overall um, overview of the, the National Building Code, Alberta Edition 2019, uh, just like a high level um, lay of the land, basically. So the, the building code comes in on two volumes, so it's volume one and volume two. Uh, so volume one has your, your division A, B, and C, and volume two has just a division B in it, and I'll get to that um, in a minute as to why. Well, well basically, I guess um, division A and division C still apply to volume two, so there's only a division B. And division B, um, just in a nutshell, is essentially the um, the prescriptive requirements, I guess, to meeting code are in that so those sections. So um, in volume one, division A, there wouldn't be a lot of stuff you go to in division A. You know, um, I, I, I've got a couple of things highlighted here. So where I would go on a day-to-day -day basis in part one of division A is the defined terms. So all the time. Okay, so you're reading the code and there's there's certain words and you're just like, well, what does that mean? And so you read the um, defined term. And a lot of times you will read something and not quite understand it and you'll think about it. And sometimes the answer to um, to the riddle is in the definition of a word. So it, it's quite um, important to use the defined terms. The other part here, um, you know, if you're new to the code, I suppose, and you're seeing some symbols being used in the language, the symbols and abbreviations are listed here as to what they mean, basically. So the other, you know, so again, defined terms would be the thing that you use often. Um, and then these other two parts here are just kind of interesting. So um, I'll start with the application of part 9, 10, and 11. So when you get to this part right here, basically, what this is telling you is if if you have a building that is less than three stories in building height has a building area again oh and whenever you see italics in the code that means it's defined so that word building area is defined in the definitions and so when you're trying to figure out well, what is my building area make sure you read that definition because it's not the area of the floors added up okay um Anyways, if you, if you had a building that was less than three stories in building height, that was less than 600 meters squared in building area, and was of one of these groups and divisions, then you could use part nine. And why does it matter, you know, whether you use part nine or say, we're gonna get to part three in a second. Um, it, there's just, it's, there's just less in it. So part nine's just gotten less requirements basically, or, or less, um, less uh, prescriptive requirements because part nine is designed for housing and small buildings. So, you know, again, you're, you're, you can't be over 600 meters squared and more than three stories in building height. So you're, you're a small building basically. So generally speaking though, in practical terms, usually part nine, I'd say the bulk of the time is being used for housing, uh, but you could certainly do a small um, apartment building or something like that. Um, so the only, the only groups missing here is your group A's, which is divisions, you know, there's divisions under group A as well, and your group B's and your F1 is missing there. Okay, so those would be higher risk type buildings. So the A's being assembly uses, so there's more public in there and, and larger numbers of people. And F1 is your your uh, more dangerous industrial um, type stuff. So that's why they're not in here. They're like, yeah, don't use this. You need to use a more, a more strict part of the code. So that's kind of part nine. Um, you know, part 10, I don't even know what that is. I've never been there. Part 10 is, what is part 10? Where would I find part 10 here? Part 10 would be under division, or volume, volume two. So part 10 is for related, uh, relocatable industrial accommodation. So I've never done that type of building. So um, if you were doing that, you'd use part nine. And then part 11 is acoustic, uh, exterior acoustic insulation. So, um, Anyways, yeah, that's kind of part nine. And then, you know, it, the next thing here is part, the applications of part three, four, five, and six. So basically, if your building doesn't fit in the parameters of this sentence down here, then you're gonna be punted into part three, four, five, and six. And so um, it's just saying, yeah, well, you know, this is where you can use this, you use part three for um, group A buildings, group B buildings, your F1 buildings, and anything exceeding that, those, uh, that building area and building height of these other occupancies. So how that really, what this really means um, in practical terms and say architectural offices is that part nine is used mainly for the low density residential firms. That's where they are all the time. 
and then part three is used in the commercial firms. And that's why, actually, I don't think I explained this at the start, that's why there's two volumes and this is why the volumes aren't actually laid out in order. Um, so, so what happened here was um, they've moved, uh, how did this work? Oh yeah, they moved part nine into volume two. So, so before there was a PDF world, there was binders. So you had a binder in the office and there's two binders because it was so big, right? The building code was so big. So they put it into two volumes basically. So there was a volume one binder and a volume two binder. And so they actually, at one point, I can't remember which year it was, but they, they moved part nine, 10 and 11 into the second binder. And, and really the reasoning probably was just because they knew that you're either going to be working in a firm that's using this binder or you're going to be in a firm that's using this binder. That's probably why they did it. It wasn't always like that. I can't remember what year it changed, but at some point that did change. And even though now we're in a PDF world, that's still the lay of the land. Okay, so some other stuff I just saw highlighted in here, or sorry, in the um, division A here was, um, we looked at those. Oh, just some other, um, some ex definitions of things, I guess, um, further explanation to what an exit is what a secondary suite is. Um, there's something there about storage garages and what a suite is. This is a, actually, this is a good read um, to understand what, what suite means, basically. Supplemental um, definition, I guess, is what it is. Okay, so that's um, all that we want to look at in part one. Then we will get into division B here. So, um, so division B covers part one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, I forgot to mention too, under the application of part three. So the part four is structural stuff. So your structural engineer would be in there. Uh, part five is environmental separation. Uh, we could maybe browse through that. We don't, you don't generally go there very often, but it, it obviously does have an architectural um, component to it. Uh, but when we get there, I can explain why we don't really go there very often. And part six is um, mechanical stuff. So um, HVAC and stuff like that. So your mechanical engineer would probably be into part six. So basically what this is kind of saying is part nine doesn't necessarily require a structural engineer um, because the, you know there's some pre-engineered stuff in part nine, like charts you could follow and just, um, you know, rules basically that have you covered basically for small housing. But when you get into part three, it automatically triggers part four. And once part four is triggered, then you, you need a structural engineer at that point. Okay, and then um, let's just move into division B here. So part three is really the bulk of, of where I spent my days, I guess, uh, working on projects that always be in part three. So part three is um, pretty intense. You know, that's giving you all the prescriptive rules basically for designing for designing a building. So, you know, I'll get into different videos for each um, section in part three uh, quite extensively, probably eventually. Your part five is that environmental separation. So, you know, obviously that's important to understand what is what, what's required from an environmental separation standpoint. But in reality, you don't come here very often because the way we design buildings just kind of naturally meets this section, I suppose, most of the time. So like, for example, um, you know, if we went to the heat transfer section, you know, there's some specific stuff there about insulation and where it's got to go and all this kind of stuff. But the way we build walls and design walls, uh, generally we meet these requirements. Um, so, you know, you're not, you're not in there very often. You know, air leakage, same kind of idea. We put air control layers on our buildings. I guess this is the section of the code that tells us to do it. Um, you know, so you don't go here to read it because we, you know, the products we put on our building meet these requirements basically. So for example, if you're going to put a, a membrane on your building, that's an air control layer, that membrane, um, the, the, the air leakage shall have an air leakage characteristic, not greater than 0 0.02 liters per second per meter squared measured at an air pressure of 75 PA, blah, blah, blah. So that that's the requirement, okay, for the air barrier system properties. Uh, so most of the products that we're specifying on our buildings would meet that basically. So that's why you're not, you know, you're not here on a regular basis. So, but the ones of interest would be um, heat transfer, air leakage, and vapor diffusion. So the vapor diffusion, basically, you know, I, if you read through this, it would pretty much just tell you that 
you should be or you need to in your buildings um, provide vapor control to prevent condensation basically in your assemblies that's that's kind of what um, this section would be talking about and the other stuff here in division b would be um, appendix c so climatic and seismic information for different areas of um, alberta so you know you wouldn't go in very often but if you needed for some reason some climatic information for elk point for example then you could find all that kind of information in here i i didn't, I didn't really find i went there very often um, and then appendix d is used a fair bit i mean it's basically when you got to start building fire ratings in buildings so in your in your walls your ceilings floors appendix d can be used to to create those fire ratings basically so uh, probably i'll have a video at some point kind of covering some more specific stuff on there where i used appendix d probably the most would be for maybe for some partitions and columns I found it was pretty useful for when you put a fire rating around a column. So, so you have a steel column that requires a one hour fire rating. There's a good section in there that could tell you how much gypsum board to put around that, that column basically to get your one hour fire rating or what have you. So that's kind of the volume one division B section. Uh, there's just nothing in division C of any, of any interest really. So again, in your volume two, so, you know, um, your division V's, your part nine. So, you know, that, that's where you would live if you were working in housing. Um, you'd be very, very familiar with part nine. And then part of, part 11, acoustical exterior insulation. I'm not even sure what this says, but, um, oh, actually I know what this is. If you're building in the, in the airport vicinity, I think, uh, this part applies to buildings that are allowed to be constructed so within airport vicinities. Yeah, so you know if you're in a building in an airport vicinity area, which is something you check in your land use um, maps, um, then there's some requirements there for um, exterior acoustic insulation to to keep the sound out basically of the building. So there's some parameters there. So unless you're working like in the airport areas, I'm, I'm not sure that you'd be here very often. Um, and I've actually worked in buildings in the airport vicinity, and I. Uh, I guess I probably was here. I just don't remember. It's been a while, but that's what that is. And uh, that's kind of the lay of the land of the building code. Okay. And, and so, you know, again, just in a nutshell where you're mainly going to be, I would say on a day-to-day -day basis is part three, um, a little bit of appendix D, the defined terms. Um, and if you're, you know, if you happen to be working in a, in a firm that does housing or whatever, then you would be pretty much in your your part nine all the time. That's kind of how it rolls. And uh, one last thing I forgot to mention here actually is the in the volume one division A, there's this part two which is the objectives of the code, and part three is the functional statements of the code. So you know you would not go to these things. Uh, generally speaking, I'd say in an architecture's office, but if you worked for a building code consultant, you might actually be in here because basically what this is, is so division three, part three, for example, is laying out the minimum prescriptive requirements to meet code. Sometimes you have designs that just don't meet what, what's in here, let's say, for example. So then you could do what's called an alternative solution. And you're basically demonstrating that this alternative solution is equal to or, or, or equal to or better than whatever would have been required here um, as a prescriptive um, thing. So, and how you do that is part of that process is, you know, you look at the objectives of the code and you look at the functional statements of the code and you actually list, you know, through your alternative solution, you're listing um, how these objectives and functional statements are met, basically. So that's kind of what an alternative solution is. So. You generally speaking, like an architect's office wouldn't do their own alternative solutions if, if they knew they had something that was going beyond the prescriptive um, requirements or prescriptive requirements, yeah, um, um, rules of the code, let's say. Then they would hire like a building code consultant that could do like fire modeling and all kinds of stuff and, and almost like almost like lawyers work and, and, and uh, come up with a, a game plan to, to prove that um, some other measures that they're doing um, satisfy the objectives and functional statements of the code and are equal to or better than what would have been required um, from a from a base um, 
um, prescriptive standpoint. You know, just an example I could think of off the top of my head was too much glazing, let's say, um, on, on a building face and you only allow a certain percentage of um, glazed area, for example, or openings on that building face, and you exceed that. Um, there, there, you know, there is there is methods you could look at to to be able to have more glazing than what would be allowed in the prescriptive measures, and that could be adding sprinkler heads to the glass so that the water uh, washes the glass, for example. So, you know, if that approach was taken, then you'd have to explain. Um, how that's working first of all and how it's meeting the objectives and functional statements that's that's kind of what those are so you wouldn't you wouldn't go there on a regular basis for sure